There we go. I'm telling you, are you glad to be in church tonight? All right. Well, I am too. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I got something to talk about. Are you surprised? Some of you go, no, no, pastor, I know you'll have something to say. Um, I, I want to get right into what God has laid on my heart tonight because I had a lot to say in a short time, and uh, I, I want to be able to get it all out or the best that I can. If you have your Bibles and want to turn there or it'll be on the screen, Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love those that you come into contact with. Several years ago, I was on a mission trip to... uh, Honduras, and uh, Alvin Anderson, our missionary there, had a guy that was training in some missionary work, and his name was Chad Barron, and uh, Chad has went on to do other things in missionary work, but there for a season he was studying under Alvin, and he made mention of something as we were getting ready to head back to the States at the end of our mission trip, and, and he said, you know, guys, people go on a mission trip, and the ones that went on that trip, they always become closer and they get to know each other and they're so amazed at how that mission trip brought them together. And he said, I want to give you the reason that happens. Has anybody here been on a mission trip? And you probably remember the people that you went with. It was something that happened on that trip that just drew you closer together. And Chad was talking about this and he went on to say, here's why. It is because in serving others together, You build lasting relationships because you're there on behalf of someone other than yourself. You're collectively there on behalf of someone other than yourself. So you don't really grow the relationships on the people that you're serving as much as you grow the relationship with the people that you're serving with those others. I mean, serving with that team that you're there together to serve others. And I thought, what a great illustration of a mission trip. That should be the church. We are together serving. And I applaud you because as I look around, I see a faithfulness. And I know there's some that that aren't here. But as I look around, I'm seeing that you all are the Wednesday night crowd. You hear me say that a lot. The Wednesday night crowd. You're the ones that say, I'm in. And I'm here to be taught, to receive, to get my marching orders because you are the ones that collectively with each one of us are serving others. And and I I just look around and I see that in the hearts of the people here. You are servants. Uh, And so you might hear me preaching tonight and you might go, well, is he talking to me? No, I'm talking about you because this is who you are. This is who, I, I, let's say it like this, we are. We're on the same team here, and we're working together. See, all of life is based on relationships. It really is. And if we don't know how to have right relationships with one another, we're missing out on the abundant life that God says is yours. Well, I love God. I know, but equally as important, you got to love others. That's right. And you do that with People that are doing that. It's just a lot easier when you get a group of people loving people than it is to try to go out there on your, uh, on your own. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but boy, just coming back here on Sundays and Wednesdays allow you to love people that for the most part can be unlovable. Come on. You, I, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. If, if someone was to ask you what the Bible was all about, it's real simple. Love God and love people. That's what the Bible's about. And, and then in doing that, God will allow you to be in loving relationships, loving God and loving people. I don't know how many of y'all have tried to love somebody that's not lovable. How well does that work for you? It's tough. I just, I just I poured my heart out to them and they just don't give anything back. What, what, why, why? That's why you come here. That's why you get a group of people around you who love you and then you go serve people who can be unlovable and you still can love them with the love of Christ even though they might reject you. Come on, he did that. 
does it still. Melanie preached this past Sunday. Man, what a message. Well, what a great, great word. We as God's people need to have the faith to love. That was what she was talking about. And one way that love is shown to others is, is outlined in Galatians chapter 6. See, as we serve others, love and serve others, love and serve others, we are fulfilling what God has called us to do as his people. Galatians 6 verse 2, share each other's burdens, and in this way, you obey the law of Christ. And let me just stop there. He's talking to the church. And in this way, church, I need y'all to share each other's burdens. And as you'll share each other's burdens, you will fulfill the law of Christ. You don't hear that term a lot. The law of Christ. Let's keep reading here. In verse 3, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. That wasn't my words. That's right out of Scripture, just so if you weren't following along. Share one another's burdens. I like the way it says this, this translation. It, It gives a visual picture. I mean, you see someone who is holding a big, heavy burden on their, on their shoulders, on their back, and they're, just, they're about to go down with it, and they're struggling. And then you come along and say, hey, let me help you. And you either bump shoulders with them, and all of a sudden you can lift that thing. I can't tell you how many times I have to call either someone from the school, Chapman, or someone, I need some help now. I can't carry this. I can't lift that before I figure out a way. But the older I get, it's just easier to have somebody share. And so you get somebody to come along with you and they share that burden. But man, it's so much better when they say, hey, can I help you? Yeah, wow, yeah. Then, hey, I need help. When they come and say, hey, I'm, I'm here, can I help you? I, I, I think of one young man in our school that does that all the time. His name's Levi Meese, if you've never met him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of crazy. Oh, he's here. Right there he is, yeah. See, I'm talking about you all tonight. This is what I see happening. And if you, he doesn't think he's too important to help someone. He, he's not fooling himself. He realizes he's not that important. But in the kingdom of God, he has died to himself and said, what can I do to start, share, share, help someone else? Help someone else carry their load. Share each other's burdens. Share their troubles. Share their problems. Now, this is an easy sentence to read, but it's way harder to put into practice. God doesn't want us to be hearers of the word only. He wants us to be doers. Okay, so we know that. And I, I just, I got to go back to this verse 2 in Galatians 6. In this way, obey the law of Christ. The law of Christ is sharing others' troubles, frustrations, trials. That's the law of Christ. When you help them out, what's the law of Christ? It's sharing yeah. the load that others are under. That's right. wow. Now, here's the thing. This church has grown a lot in the last 19 years. And I find myself frustrated when I find out that someone's under a load and they've already worked through it or they've been under it for a long time and I didn't know anything about it. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that's tough. You, you know, people get offended because they were under a load and we didn't even know they were under a load. I've had people get offended because they were in the hospital and nobody even told me. Well, why, why, Pastor? I know. It's your fault because you knew. So what would you do about it? See, I, I just want you to understand that as pastor, not everything gets by me. I mean, a lot of things get, go past and I didn't even know it happened. And then we got people offended and hurt and frustrated with the church because they thought they were going to be treated a certain way, and they weren't. And there are times that maybe the church did mess up, and I'm sorry. There's other times that no one knew that implemented anything. I'm talking to you now because we are, this is us. This is the Wednesday night crowd. See, when we're not sharing each other's burdens, guess what? We're lawbreakers. I mean, if that's the law of Christ then I don't want to be a lawbreaker. Some people would argue, but Pastor, I've got enough troubles and problems on my own. Life is so hard. I can't help anybody else right now. I just got to take care of me, myself, and I. I get that, but I don't think that's you because you're the Wednesday night crowd and God's doing supernatural things in your life. Not that you're not ever under a struggle, but I think you've got enough people surrounding you 
that they know what you're dealing with and they jump in. Well, why wouldn't they do that for someone else? They didn't know. They didn't know. You're, you're connected. See, Paul makes a bold statement here when he says, if you think you're too important, you're fooling yourself. You're really a nobody. Do you know why people don't want to help people? Because they think they're too important to help somebody else. Again, that's not you. So as I'm preaching this, everybody knows people that didn't help or wouldn't help someone, but I'm not talking to you tonight in that manner because I know that you will and do. We don't think we're too important, and I want to encourage you, if you have been kind of thinking that, well, I don't have anything I can do for someone else, I'm telling you, you've matured enough that you do. And maybe you just needed to hear that tonight. You are mature enough in the word, in the faith. You've been sitting here receiving and receiving. I mean, I'm not seeing anybody I don't know in here. You guys have been sitting under the word. You've been receiving. You're faithful to the word. Now the word has magnified itself and you're in a place in life. In fact, let me just tell you, I have a red shirt on tonight. And I saw Santa Claus yesterday. And he said, hey, brother. And I took him serious. I... In the Christian life, at some point, we have to see ourselves as Santa Claus. We are the provider of the blessing because we know the provider that has blessed us. See, we're the provider. We're the one who says, hey, what can we do? And I know I'm looking around, and I I just know that's you. God sent Jesus, and I want to make sure you understand that I don't think you're too important. I think that you realize that, and because you realize that, you are finding ways to bless, help, and encourage others. God sent Jesus to come and pay what we couldn't pay. He came to take on our burden that we couldn't pay, the debt that we owed that we couldn't pay. He took a heavy load off of us. Come on. He took that load off us, and he saw us as important. I want to back this up scripturally. Philippians 2, verse 6, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Oh, I got to carry my own burden. If you only knew, Pastor, the problems and the troubles that I have personally going on in my own life, it's so hard for me to deal with my own stuff. Okay, you're not Santa Claus with that thinking. What makes you Santa Claus is when you're figuring out how to build, do, and develop everything so that you can bless That's the reason why God is prospering you in this life. So that you don't get to a place where it's just like, here I am. No, you're at a place where, here I serve. Here's who I, here's what I can do. Here's who I can help. Here's what I can do for someone else. See, Jesus did that all for us, and we know that. He took on our trouble. I I want to tell you something. If you get your eyes off your own problems just for a day or two, you may be listening to this on podcast because I'm not talking to you all right here at church. Oh, you're talking to so- Open your eyes and look at all the problems in the lives of people around you and all of a sudden yours don't become so big. There is joy in the Holy Spirit that comes to you when you begin helping other people because you're doing kingdom work. You're doing God work. Now, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, John 4, verse 34, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me, and from finishing his work. Your spiritual nourishment, Jesus' spiritual nourishment, come from doing God's will and and finishing it. Finishing it. You're not done. Everybody's like, take a big breath. Oh, yeah, you're still alive. So you're not finished. Jesus, as he took his last one, said it is finished. Everything that he needed to do was accomplished. You're still breathing. You're not finished. So you're going to keep working. I'm going to keep working. And here's what I can tell you. When we get busy helping other people, there's a joy and a strength that comes into our lives and allows us to keep going till we are finished. Thank God you're not finished. God's not done with you. Romans 15, verse 2 
says we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. What Jesus did, he didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but he waited right in the middle of them. That's what Jesus did. He found out there's a problem, guess where he was at? Right in the middle of their problem so that he could lead them into a solution. All right, I just want to read out of the message what Romans 15, verse 3, the end of this says. It says, I took on the troubles of the troubled. Let that sink in for just a second. I took on the troubles of the troubled. We get to a place in our maturity where as, and I don't like using the example of Santa Claus all the time, you got to understand I'm just making us, I, I, I'm, I'm making sure you understand you get to a place of maturity that you're not so worried about being a recipient of Santa Claus, but you get to a place where you are the ones who are the giver to the people who are in need of the receiving. And so if we get to a place in our pursuit of Christ that we take on the troubles of the troubled, we really start looking like Jesus. When Melanie was preaching Sunday, the Lord impressed on me some of what she was talking about from Barna's research and some different things that she had looked up that for the most part, people that claim Christianity don't have any problem. Did you hear this on Sunday? They don't have any problem with Jesus, but they have a problem with the church or people that are representing Jesus. That's their problem. It's not with Jesus. And I believe that it's because the church doesn't always act like Jesus. And I get that. But I can just tell you, if we were Jesus, we wouldn't need him and we're still all in need of him. And they just in their immaturity don't see the difference. But I want to give you something to think about. To separate, which they're doing in their mind, they're separating Jesus from the church. And in Ephesians 5, it talks about the marriage union as an example of Jesus and the bride, the church, and his love for the bride. Here's what we can know about marriage. When you've met a husband, you're going to eventually meet the wife. When you've met the wife, you're going to meet the husband. And what I can tell you about that is someone in a marriage that meets someone, I have found this a lot. Someone likes the husband and doesn't like the wife. That's, that's, not, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> someone meets the wife and likes the wife but don't like the husband. That's this person that's looking at wow. Jesus. I like Jesus, but I don't like his bride. Wow. I like the groom, but I don't like... The bride. I, I like the bride, but I don't care much for the groom. Well, well here's the deal. You better like both of them because they are one. Yeah. And you can't separate Jesus from his bride. So all these people that have got a wrong view of the bride, I get that. But when you get to know Jesus, you will get to know the bride. You're not going to get to know me very long and not know her. See, it's just not going to happen that way because... And the illustration that God's given is the husband and wife, and you're not going to know Jesus and not be associated with the church. Or it's going to be very superficial, and you're not going to look like him at all. Because if you want to look like him, you've got to be associated with the church. Once again, I'm not talking to you. I applaud you. Because that's who you are. The enemy can make you think that you're not connected or that, the, that Jesus and the church are not. The enemy can say Jesus isn't in that church. And I've met a few I've wondered about. But I'm just telling you, Jesus is highly connected to his church. And so I want to encourage you tonight to know that if we can't separate that, then we need to be doing what Jesus is doing. And what Jesus did is he took on the troubles of the troubled. Are you getting this tonight? Okay. You might say, okay, I don't know that I get that. Well, I just want you to put that in your thinker and think on that. Because it's very, very important in life to make life about someone other than yourself. Make it 
about someone else. Make it about someone else.